Good evening, I'm Ellen Peary. I'm the County Supervisor for the Second District, which includes Aptos, and I wanna welcome you and thank you for coming out this evening. We're hoping to have a really good conversation about drugs, drug addiction, incarceration, and alternatives to incarceration. First, let me thank, thank Aptos High School for allowing us to be here this evening in their beautiful new Performing Arts Center. Also, I wanna thank Community TV of Santa Cruz for um, taping us and showing us in the future. Tonight's forum um, is hosted by Smart on Crime, Santa Cruz County, and co-sponsored by more than 35 local organizations and entities from chambers of commerce to nonprofits to local media. Smart on Crime is a group that is a partnership between scholars, professionals in the justice system, government leaders, and community members who are interested in more effective criminal justice practices and policies. The Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors has a long-standing commitment to alternatives to incarceration. We have a jail overcrowding task force we have a model, widely respected pretrial program, and we have support for programs that get people out of jail and hopefully keep them out of jail. With recent changes in state law, with the state budget crisis, and with the federal courts ordering California to reduce its prison population, we have an opportunity to improve our local criminal justice system reduce the number of people who cycle in and out of jail, and hopefully make our community safer. So the format for this evening is that we will have the four speakers up here. Um, they will each have a, a talk for 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 minutes, I think. Um, we'll have a question and answer period at the end, and the way we're doing the question and answer is that in the, uh, the uh, materials that you got when you came in, including your program, there are some cards, little three by five cards. So if you just wanna write out questions, we will have pe per people circulating um, to pick up. So if you have a question, just wave your card in the air and somebody will come uh, get it. And then um, when the speakers have completed that, Supervisor John Leopold will be coming up and he will be moderating the question and answer period. Um, also in your packets, on the top is a questionnaire, and we would very much appreciate it if at the end of the program you filled out that questionnaire and returned it to us. Um, it's part of a community uh, engagement effort to really find out what people think about the criminal justice system and look for ideas of ways to improve it. If you've already filled one of those out at a past forum, you don't need to do that again. So let me start by introducing our first speaker, and that is our Sheriff, Phil Wowack. Sheriff Wowack is the Chief Law Enforcement Officer for the county and is responsible for all aspects of public safety, including, including operation of the county jail system. Um, so let me give it to Phil and remember those cards. Thank you, Ellen. Good evening. Um, as Ellen mentioned, my name's Phil Wowack. I'm the county sheriff, and um, a number of the different uh, responsibilities that I hold as your elected sheriff um, include um, managing the county jail system. Um, if you don't know about our, our county jail system, we have uh, two different uh, holding facilities for adult inmates in Santa Cruz County. One is at uh, uh, the Water Street facility adjacent to the courthouse in Santa Cruz, and the second facility is in um, Watsonville, adjacent to the county landfill, and it's the uh, Roundtree Lane Men's uh, Corrections Facility. Our correction system uh, was designed in the 1970s to, to hold upwards of 700 uh, adult inmates in our uh, facility. Um, and over uh, time, and in the recent years, we've brought down um, the authorized number of beds that we can uh, hold inmates in our facility to roughly 450. Uh, my numbers are a little off because uh, I don't run the jail system on a regular basis. The chief of corrections and our uh, warden is with me here today, uh, Chief Jim Hart, and he runs the entire correction system. 
Um, when we get to the question and answer period, if you have any questions about the jail system, um, I'll either answer them for you or, or ask Chief Hart to address them. So as Ms. Peary uh, mentioned when she introduced the program tonight, we're here to talk really about crime and punishment. What has changed in California and in Santa Cruz County with regard to crime, criminal prosecution, and punishment of, of offenders in, um, in California? So we have a fairly large group here tonight. If I could just get a show of hands of who knows what Assembly Bill 109 or prison realignment is. Okay, virtually everybody here. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on, on Assembly Bill 109, but I will tell you that it is a state law in California that changed where a person serves their criminal sentence after conviction in the state of California. Prior to October 1st last year, if you were convicted of a felony um, that had more than one year in jail, um, you would serve that sentence in a state prison system. If you were convicted and sentenced to less than a year in jail, you would serve that time in our local county jail system. The change in California law brought a shift of prison population from the jail systems to local communities. Um, this, is, this didn't happen overnight, um, and there's a mem number of uh, uh, folks in this room, uh, members of our panel and members of our audience, that worked on this transition and, and brought about this change in California, uh, mainly because California's prison system was, was significantly overcrowded. It was um, essentially ruled cruel and unusual punishment to be sent to state prison in California, and California was mandated to reduce its prison system population uh, over time, and that brought about um, Assembly Bill 109 or the prison realignment. So shifting the population of state prison inmates to county jails um, was no easy task. Um, last year, when Assembly Bill 109 went into effect on o October 1st, our county jail system was at about 125 percent of capacity. So every day we had about 50 inmates more than we had beds living in our jail system. And on October 1st, we knew that folks sentenced to state prison the year prior for nonviolent, non-sex, and non-serious crimes would wind up being sentenced in Santa Cruz County Jail. So we had what I affectionately call an inventory control problem. We knew we were going to be taking in more folks than we had room for. So we had to make uh, some very quick and very um, challenging decisions. And we have to reach out to people like yourselves and the community and really engage you in a, a artful discussion about what is punishment versus a crime and where we uh, house people and when, what do we really believe um, county jail is there to serve. Um, I can tell you that as, as the sheriff and as the, the person who runs the jail system, we believe that our correction system has three responsibilities. The first is public safety. We have to incarcerate people to keep them from reoffending or causing uh, pain um, or suffering uh, to the general public. So we lock people up to keep uh, the community safe. The second is accountability. Uh, another word for accountability is punishment. Okay, you are sentenced to a, a jail or prison sentence to serve a, a length of time um, to pay your debt to society. What prison realignment did is change that middle piece, that, that punishment or accountability piece. And we had to accept the fact that punishment was not going to be served prior to Assembly Bill 109 in the same way as after. Now, we're very fortunate to live in Santa Cruz County because that was not a hard um, pill to swallow in Santa Cruz County. We already had a significant number of, of programs in place um, to deal with um, an overcrowded jail system and to deal with punishment and corrections at the community level. And by that I, I, I mean that we had a, a very um, progressive um, judicial uh, uh, panel, the bench in Santa Cruz County that sentenced people to, uh, uh, to jail systems were very creative in their sentences and, and in their corrective model. We had a very uh, progressive, and he's seated here in the audience, uh, probation chief, Chief uh, Scott McDonald, who worked with us on keeping our, our jail population down and holding uh, offenders accountable in um, the community. 
So we didn't have a, 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 as big a challenge as other communities, but we did have a very big challenge on our hands as Assembly Bill 109 came into place. Now, I mentioned there were three pieces that, that Corrections is responsible for. Number one was public safety. Number two was accountability or punishment. The third was something that I don't think we did a very good job of. And I don't know that anybody really has figured this out because anybody in here who's a parent is sitting next to someone who's a parent. How do we correct behavior? Okay, We do it individually and we do it based on the offender. And so when my child does something wrong, I try and correct that behavior in the best way I know how with our, um, our human interaction. In Santa Cruz County and in many jail systems, we failed in the corrective behavior uh, department. And what, uh, what my staff has done is we've embraced uh, Assembly Bill 109 and prison realignment to try and bring a corrections model to our correction system. We call it corrections as opposed to detention. In the 80s and 90s, our, uh, our uh, jail system was called detention. Well, detention is nothing more than putting a person in a timeout and doing nothing to correct the behavior that put them there. Um, under Sheriff Mark Tracy in the 90s, our uh, detention bureau was, was changed to corrections, and we tried to apply as many uh, programs as possible in the correction system to reduce offenders reoffense after uh, leaving and we did that by uh, providing different programs in uh, uh, the facility. Now when I say we embraced Assembly Bill 109, we tried to use um, the state allocation that came and the legal responsibility that came from the state to work on our corrections model. After Assembly Bill 109 went into effect, each individual county formed what is called a Community Corrections Partnership. And our probation chief is the chair, just like all 58 counties in, in California, the probation chief is the chair of that partnership. And that partnership is responsible for building a corrections model for each individual community that fits that community need. Now, I'm proud to be up here today and talking to you about this model because I think that Santa Cruz County has been the most successful county in the state. Uh, number one, because we had those prior systems in place, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago. But we also have people that work together in this justice system on a regular basis and do so efficiently. Um, I'm pointing my finger at the other 57 counties in the state of California when I make that statement because a lot of counties don't have that collaboration and, and that uh, cooperation with their own government systems, let alone the community and, and groups like uh, yourselves here. Um, I'm going to shift um, uh, gears just a second, and I want to tell you what we did in response to Assembly Bill 109. Um, as soon as the law went into effect, we knew that we were going to get a, a segment of uh, state prisoners coming to our jail system effective um, October 1st. We anticipated that that number would be in the 70 per year range, and we knew that those inmates would stay with us for a significant length of time, above and beyond what our, our previous population did. Now, prior to October 1st, the average length of stay in Santa Cruz County Jail for an inmate was 32 days. So you would uh, have an offense, you would go through the court system, you would get convicted, and you would be sentenced, and of all the people that were sentenced to Santa Cruz County Jail prior to October 1st of last year, the average length of stay was 32 days. We, after October 1st, began to receive long sentences, the longest being eight years now. Um, uh, a person has been sentenced to county jail. And so you can imagine that that math problem is going to grow um, in future years, and the average length of stay is probably going to eclipse 100 days this year, and it will probably be in the neighborhood of 200 to 250 days next year for all of our um, inmate population. That brought about some challenges, number one, with bed space, number two, with care in custody, and number three, in the types of programs that we were going to offer uh, to our inmate population. So I, I mentioned Chief Hart, who, who's in the audience today. He and I got together before that October 1st date. Um, we worked uh, collaboratively with uh, uh, the Smart on Crime series, with the probation chief, and with a number of members of the Community Corrections Partnership. And we came up with a program that we implemented on, on December or October 1st uh, of last year. The first piece that we put into place was a, a custody alternatives program. So we built a program 
that gave alternatives to incarceration, a program that didn't require you to just go to jail, spend time in jail, and then leave either on probation or having served your sentence. We looked at the offense that a person was in custody for, and we essentially built a model where low-level offenders, misdemeanor offenders who were in custody for theft-related crimes, um, um, uh, drug abuse type crimes, crimes that didn't present a uh, risk to the community in a safety uh, um, aspect. We built a uh, electronic monitoring system and we moved that population into that custody alternatives program. Now to date, we've had over 100 people participate in that electronic monitoring program. And on any given day, um, as of today, we have in excess of 40 people on that program. Now this time last year, those people were in our custody, in our uh, clothing, sleeping in our beds, and they were taking up the space that we needed for our um, uh, prison realignment inmates. So we built that uh, program to, number one, to, um, to build capacity in the jail system, but number two, to create what we know has to grow into our future um, correction system. And that's an incentive-based carceration system. We believe that every inmate that comes into uh, custody in Santa Cruz County must be given an opportunity to succeed, both in custody and to break a cycle, whatever that cycle is, that put them into custody in our system when they're returned back to the community. So the custody alternatives program is essentially a carrot. It's a carrot for each and every inmate. If they work in the system to better themselves in the system, they can earn the ability to do a portion of their custody outside of our uh, jail facility on a monitoring program under direct supervision. It's not something that's automatically granted to someone. And I use this analogy. When my son was young, he's old now, or older, but when he was young and I asked him to clean his room, he did an okay job. But when his girlfriend was coming over and he did it on his own, he did a much better job because it was his idea, not mine. And so our incentive-based incarceration system is built on that model. If an inmate comes into custody and they work through the program and we give them the opportunity to succeed and they earn their way out, they do significantly better on the outside. Now, we just started this program nine months ago. And as of today, um, the numbers of, of um, AB 109 or 1170H inmates in our custody are 60. We have had 60 people uh, sentenced to county jail that last year would have gone uh, to state prison. And we're only two thirds of the way through the, the year. So we know when we hit uh, October of, next, of this year, we will um, most likely eclipse the 70 uh, mark that we thought we were gonna get in the first year. So our job is really to create a system, number one, that creates capacity for that group, and number two, um, puts together a correction system in our um, uh, incarceration model that helps people build uh, their way out of uh, the system. Now, as of today, we've built the electronic monitoring system, the custody alternative system. We've also added uh, a significant amount of capacity in the work release program. Um, and by this time next year, we believe that we will have just as many folks in custody alternatives as we do in custody. So if Santa Cruz County grows to a 500 inmate population, we will probably have that number of people, um, half of that number of people out of custody. Um, I'm gonna stop there because I'm getting the, uh, the, the time sign and I'm gonna um, save some of the uh, statistical information that I have for you with regard to the jail system uh, for the question and answer period. So I'm gonna invite uh, uh, Supervisor Peary up and, uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Craig Reinerman. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Warwick. Craig Reinemann is our next speaker. He's a professor of sociology and legal studies at UCSC. Dr. Reinemann has authored many books and articles on drug use, law, and policy. He's a consultant to the World Health Organization on Substance Abuse. Please welcome Dr. Reinemann. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. 
thanks to Susan Green and her colleagues for organizing this. At times like these, <clears throat> we are reminded of the, uh, the horrors of crime, uh, lives so lost and uh, families torn apart and uh, the fabric of the community uh, ripped. And uh, <clears throat> at times like these, we're apt to uh, want to respond with fear and even uh, vengeance. And I'd like to begin tonight by uh, suggesting that those are not really good foundations for uh, public policy. And <clears throat> my particular angle is, uh, has to do with drug abuse. And we all know that drug abuse and addiction are bound up with crime, or at least a significant portion of crime, uh, important pieces of the puzzle. But the relation between uh, drug abuse and crime is always more complicated than we usually imagine. And uh, less directly causal uh, and more contingent. So I want to uh, show, uh, to begin with, introduce you to a few uh, measures of the sort of national effort we've been uh, engaged in um, on the drug war. I guess I point this back there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to fly through a few of these uh, graphs. They're, they're, um, I'm happy to answer questions about them afterwards, but uh, basically this just shows that the um, the drug czar's budget, the federal government, uh, went from about uh, $2 billion when Ronald Reagan came into office to uh, over 23 or 4 billion, it's, it truncated there at the end, uh, by the time uh, President Bush II uh, left office. Uh, that's a, a over a tenfold increase. And one of the results is that the percentage of total federal prisoners, and there's a very parallel curve at the state level in most states, uh, percentage of total prison population sentenced for drug offenses uh, similarly skyrocketed up beginning in the 1980s um, with some harsh new laws that were passed to, uh, to do something about crack cocaine. Uh, they called for mandatory minimum sentences, long sentences. Um, and <clears throat> it came to pass by 2006 that Drug offenses were the largest single category of offense, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics and the Justice Department, uh, more than violent crime, certainly, and more even than property crime. Um, and indeed, just to put it in a little bit of comparative uh, framework, uh, there are more people in prison in the United States for drug offenses than there are in all of the European Union countries combined for all offenses combined. We're pretty tough on our drug offenders in this country. Um, <clears throat> and they have a much higher population, uh, another 100 million people beyond US population. Um, that has put us at the top of a list that um, uh, we, we really shouldn't be proud to be at the top of, and that is the uh, incarceration rate. How many people per 100,000 population are incarcerated? And this uh, figure is now at 751 on this graph. We're at the very top. Um, and it's now up to 753 or 4 at this point. And that is, just again, to put it in comparative perspective, that is somewhere between 5 and 12 times more than all of the other modern industrialized democracies that we normally compare ourselves to. Uh, Canada, Australia, and England, Ireland, France, Germany, and so on. Uh, five or ten times as many people incarcerated. And again, the largest single reason for that uh, is the drug war. Um, when Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981, there were about 50,000 uh, drug offenders in America's prisons. Um, and last year, or 2010, the last year for which we have data, um, it was 500,000. That's a tenfold increase. So <clears throat> this raises a question, was this, people talk a lot about crime waves. Well, what we've had is a, an imprisonment wave. And during most of this time, for the last 15 years, crime in most categories has been declining. Uh, and so the question is, well, did this imprisonment wave, um, was that sparked by some massive increase uh, in, in drug use? And all the indicators suggest there are lots of ups and downs, but, but basically the answer to that is no. Uh, this is a graph um, based on the National Household Survey 
uh, on drug use. And <clears throat> this is for people 12 years uh, old and older. Uh, and it goes from 1982 on out to 2006. The blue line, I'm sorry the key didn't print there to show you this, but uh, the blue uh, line is marijuana. And that was declining through most of this period. It took an uptick in the early 2000s and then leveled off again. Cocaine is the green line, and that's been down and then pretty stable. And heroin, never very big, uh, has remained pretty stable all along. So no evidence whatsoever that this massive increase in the number of people incarcerated in America for drug offenses was driven by any increase in drug use. This is, a, in effect, a policy choice that we have made. Does all this imprisonment eliminate or even substantially reduce our most serious drug problems? Again, I, I'm uh, sad to, to say uh, that it didn't. Um, one of the indicators that's very often used by um, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the Drug Czar's Office, um, is the price and purity. The idea being that if we can interdict a lot of supplies and arrest a lot of drug smugglers, and uh, ideally you would, you would arrest and imprison uh, kingpins, um, they're pretty rare, uh, rarely caught. Um, the price would go up, and that would mean it would be more difficult to use, fewer people would start using, fewer people would get in trouble, and so forth. Um, but as you can see, the price has declined fairly steadily uh, from 1980 through 1999, while the purity, on the other hand, which makes it easier to abuse, easier to get in trouble, uh, has gone up from, it used to be down to next to nothing, just under 4%, uh, now up uh, tenfold. So, for all of the money that we've spent, many billions, some people estimate $50 billion a year spent on the, on the drug war, most of it for police and prisons, uh, for all of this expenditure of taxpayer dollars, uh, what are we getting for that? Um, we're not getting uh, an increase in price that puts these drugs out of reach, uh, and we're not getting a, um, a decline in, in, uh, in, in purity uh, that would discourage use. Um, <clears throat> Next slide here. Oh, this is a, these are DEA figures, by the way, and they, they, they shoved in, uh, it was $6 to, to get high in 1970. It was, it was only 1.5% pure. Um, cost about $4 for a unit. Uh, that's now down uh, to 80 cents, to use their figures, and the purity's back up to 38%. Um, this is another slide for, that was, first one was for heroin. This is for cocaine. The blue line being um, the, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm having a hard time reading this from here, uh, purity. Um, you can see that the price per gram has been sort of headed up and the purity uh, has been headed down. Same problem, the opposite of what you would hope for for all the expenditure of the tax dollars. So if we can't, and I, I infer from this, I want to suggest to you uh, that we can't incarcerate our way out of our drug problems. We've been trying this for the better part of the 20th century and so far in the 21st century. Um, and there are ups and downs in the drug use indicators, um, but there's, there's no real drop off in drug problem indicators in the rate of addiction, a number of people who are getting arrested, uh, getting into various kinds of trouble. Uh, lots of people are, are lining up for, for, for treatment, but much treatment um, goes, uh, need for treatment goes unmet. So what can we do? And so I want to start with just a few characteristics uh, based on surveys of people who were in county jail. 60% um, have less than high school education. Uh, half of them are or have been homeless. 20% have been diagnosed as having a mental illness. Uh, and it's certainly uh, the case that many more uh, go undiagnosed. So that's a very conservative estimate. 50% uh, were booked on alcohol-related offenses. Doesn't mean that's the only thing that they did, the only charge, uh, but alcohol is involved in, in a, a huge proportion. And 66% were repeat offenders. And I think thanks to some of the programs the sheriff has implemented and probation department has implemented, uh, that's much lower than the, the statewide average. Uh, but still 66%, two out of three repeat offenders is, is pretty high. So anything we can do to reduce that rate of recidivism is going to be, in the longer term, 
good for the safety of our community. So what these figures suggest to me is that there's an awful lot of unmet basic human needs out there uh, that are part and parcel of the context of drug abuse, addiction, and the kinds of offenses that are related to it. Um, this is a, a, a kind of broader measure. If you situate a lot of Western uh, countries, um, the, the index of drug abuse is on the vertical axis here from low to high, and income inequality uh, goes from low to high out on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, there's a, a, a trend line that shoots through the middle, where the higher the inequality, uh, the higher the, the, the drug use. Now, we are not the top because Australia has that honor. Uh, we're right up there even with the UK and, and New Zealand, but uh, you can tell the, uh, the shape of the line, the, the, the slope of that line, uh, suggests a very strong relationship between income inequality uh, and drug use. So <clears throat> that's an, another sort of a broader comparative angle uh, uh, on the, the underlying sources of our drug problems. So <clears throat> I want to borrow here from the logic of drug courts. Drug courts are <clears throat> were started by uh, judges who were really quite fed up with the revolving door. They kept seeing the same faces over and over again. Uh, people would come in for petty crime. Uh, and underneath it all basically was an addiction problem. And so these judges got together and basically said, uh, let's in effect sentence them to treatment. Um, and so <clears throat> drug court movement was born. Uh, and there are, drug courts have lots of fans out there. Uh, but the logic was, if we want to do something about addict crime, we have to deal with the underlying addiction. And I think that logic can be extended so that if we want to deal with the addiction, uh, we have to pay attention to the underlying pain and trauma uh, and unmet basic human needs um, that underlie so much of addiction. Now, this is strongly correlated with inequality and poverty and all the problems and troubles that go with that. Um, it's not reducible to that because we all know people who are uh, middle, middle class or even affluent uh, who get themselves in serious trouble with alcohol or other drugs. Uh, so it's, it's an equal opportunity um, form of trouble. Uh, but basically, uh, if, if it follows from that, that treatment and social services aren't going to eliminate these problems, but uh, they can reduce drug abuse, addiction, and the c collateral damage that they cause in some significant way. So, um, <clears throat> Treatment is the, a crucial part. You'll hear more about this from Jang in a minute. Um, treatment is an essential part of the solution. Uh, treatment, I should say right off, is, is not going to be the answer in all cases. Um, it's not the case that everyone who gets arrested for a, a drug offense is an addict. Uh, some of them are just using these drugs. Uh, they don't have the, what, what many people consider to be the disease of addiction. Uh, they broke the law. But treatment is not the answer for, for everyone. But it's certainly uh, helpful for people who are uh, the most deeply involved with drugs to the point where they can't stop even though they experience difficulties in their lives that have to do with their health or their family or their jobs. Um, most people require more than one attempt to, to succeed. Uh, if 35 to 45 percent, depending on the type of treatment and the type of client, uh, how long they've been addicted and so forth, uh, older people tend to uh, get out at a certain point, whereas that's more a difficult move if you're a little bit younger. Um, but somewhere between 35 and 45 percent of the people who complete treatment succeed, and, and that is defined as staying clean away from drugs for a period of a year or two, depending on, on the study. Um, most people require more than one attempt. Uh, I was reminded of the, uh, the old line, I think it's from Mark Twain, but I'm, I'm not sure, it sounds like him, uh, about quitting smoking. Uh, quitting smoking is easy, I've done it a hundred times, he said. Well, if that's true about cigarettes, it's also true about other drugs, heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> this, we need all kinds of different treatment programs. There are some that are just sort of emergency. Right now, you're, uh, you suffer from alcohol poisoning or an overdose or something. You need detoxification, uh, more long-term uh, programs. 
like uh, in residential programs, sometimes called therapeutic communities. We have several good ones in this community. Um, drug substitution therapies have the highest rate of success for opiate addicts, that's to say methadone uh, and Welbutrin. Um, and then 12-step groups would probably help more than uh, any other form of treatment. Uh, started by Alcoholics Anonymous, but now encompassing every other substance and as well as shopping and work and all kinds of other sex, all kinds of other um, behaviors that people can go overboard with. Um, we need all of those things and we have all of those things, but we just don't have them in the, in the uh, insufficient quantities. This is a slide because counter, kind of counterintuitive because <clears throat> you may remember back in the 80s when the uh, national crack hysteria was upon us, uh, <clears throat> this drug was said to be the most addictive substance uh, ever known to man. That was the phrase, repeated everywhere, even in the best newspapers. Um, well, if you look carefully at the figures from the national surveys, uh, it turns out that over 80% of the people who had ever in their lives tried crack hadn't done so in the past year. A lot of people say, wait a minute, I don't want to go there. This is a scary drug. You can't do this regularly and have a life. And if people who have a life want to preserve the life, uh, and they, they knock it off, they straighten up, they quit, they get clean. Sometimes it's with a lot of difficulty, sometimes with a little difficulty, sometimes with treatment, sometimes not. But it's possible even with a drug that is said to be the most addictive ever. Um, meanwhile, this graph, this is again from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, uh, is a kind of measure of unmet need. The, um, without going into any of the details, the, the, uh, we're talking about uh, millions here. There are 23 million at that last bar. Um, and we have for illicit drugs and for alcohol and for both. But the, the key thing to notice about this graph is that the light colored blue uh, is, these are all people who, in the, by their definition, require treatment. They need treatment. Um, the dark blue portion of the bars are the people who are getting treatment. The light blue, much larger portion of the bars, are the people who are need, in need of treatment but not getting it. So <clears throat> it's a pretty gripping visual indicator of the, uh, the amount of additional treatment that's necessary. Again, this is national figure, uh, but there's, there's no reason to suspect that there are too many communities out there that are, uh, have too much of it. So it's probably true pretty much across the board that we have unmet need. Now, um, uh, I guess I want to say something about some trends in drug policy. The uh, failure, really, of the war on drugs of all these many years, first declared by Richard Nixon in 1970, um, they've had their way, really, with law, uh, with federal funding, with state funding, um, and our drug problems are still with us. Uh, the problem, problem indicators and use indicators go up and down a little bit, but they never really go away. So um, <clears throat> we're not the first ones to have noticed that something different needs to be tried. Uh, harm reduction policies, like substitution therapy for methadone, um, which still outlawed in places like Russia and lots of other countries, uh, this has slowly spread across the world. Uh, also needle exchange, which has done extraordinary uh, work in reducing the spread of HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C, uh, and a variety of other sort of user-friendly uh, services um, have spread to 75 countries, uh, some very conservative ones too, uh, in the past 25 years. Uh, there have been various steps toward decriminalization uh, in Switzerland, in the Netherlands, in, uh, most recently in Portugal. And pretty much all the indicators are their drug problems don't go away either, but they're markedly less. And the amount of additional damage caused by incarceration uh, is strikingly reduced. Uh, so they're really ha they have been better off and set a certain example that's now um, quite attractive to a number of other countries. Uh, a Global Drug Commission report, which came out last year, called for uh, any number of things along these lines, but their basic uh, core conclusion, core finding, was that we really need a shift of gaze. We need to look at these things differently. We need to move it away from criminal law and punishment 
save the jail cells for people who are really a danger to the community, violent criminals, sexual offenders, and the like, and get people the help they need to get out from under addiction problems. Um, so they want to shift the gaze away from criminal law and punishment to public health and social services. So <clears throat> you may have uh, read recently when President Obama was meeting with the, uh, uh, the presidents of various Latin American countries, uh, there were several of them, an increasing number all the time, including the president of Mexico, who were saying we really need to change uh, the basic framework of drug policy uh, in much the same way the Global Commission recommended uh, as a strategy for uh, winding down uh, the cartels. We now have a huge army and billions of, of dollars in U.S. tax support, uh, and, and yet there's more and more violence. And in northern Mexico, very close to 50,000 people have died in the last five years, um, mostly battles between cartels over market territory, but we, the United States, are that market. Um, and we need, uh, we've also seen increasing pressure on UN drug control agencies. These are the people who, uh, in effect, enforce the treaties that almost all nations on the globe have signed that say, we're going to criminalize these drugs. Uh, there's more and more people opposing that now, uh, and more and more, oops, I'm leaning on this the wrong way here. Um, and, and more and more countries that are sort of lining up to say to the UN agencies, we need to think differently, we need to move in the direction of public health, not criminal law. Uh, <clears throat> now, I don't want to seem uh, naive or idealistic here. Uh, none of these problems are going to be easy to solve. None of them are going to be solved with a, uh, waving any kind of magic wand, uh, whether that's legalization, decriminalization, uh, more treatment, or more of the same. Our drug problems are going to be here to stay. We can only uh, do our best to, to reduce them, to minimize the damage that they cause. Uh, and so <clears throat> I have to say that there are no really good drug policies, nothing that's ideal that's going to make all this go away. There are only less bad ones, drug policies that do less damage. Um, prison, one of the first, in our first event, um, we, we had a great presentation by my colleague Craig Haney, uh, who's an expert on on prisons and the effects of incarceration. Uh, and without oversimplifying uh, uh, his argument, um, prison doesn't really socialize people to, uh, to bring out their best instincts. If you're always looking over your shoulder, you know, who's going to knife you, who's going to beat you up, this is not the sort of well, the, the attitude we want people walking around the streets in. Um, so prison uh, will brutalize, it will further marginalize people who are usually already marginalized. Uh, and stigmatize them with a, a record, uh, a big hole in their resume that's hard to explain when they go to apply for a job. Um, and if effectively, in most cases, leaves people less able to live a drug-free, crime-free life um, when they get out. The opposite of what we would hope our public policy would achieve. Um, so instead of incarcerating uh, drug offenders um, I recommend that we try to divert as many as we can possibly divert into various other community alternatives that are based in treatment, um, except for those who are especially dangerous uh, to public safety and to, to the community. Uh, save the jail cells for them. Um, uh, but most drug users can get help, and they can turn their lives around, and eventually do. Uh, the only question is how much damage they're going to do in the meantime to themselves and their families and the community. Um, so more treatment. And treatment alone is not going to be enough. If you read uh, the, I recently read a, um, the latest issue of the Lancet uh, Medical Journal, uh, has a review of 100 studies uh, about the effectiveness of drug treatment. And one clear theme is that the treatments that work the best, have the highest rate of success for the largest part of the population, are those where you not only get drug treatment, but you get other social services as part of the deal. Um, and prevention. Um, I don't know any teacher, uh, even in a wonderful high school like this, uh, who will say, we have enough after school activities. There's enough music for kids who want music. There's enough sports for kids who want sports. And there's otherwise meaningful roles for young people in the community that gives them 
some sort of satisfaction, some sort of connection to the rest of us uh, that will insulate them against whatever temptations uh, they run across. We don't have anywhere near enough of that. And if, we want, if we're serious about preventing uh, drug problems in the front end, uh, we have to do better there as well. Um, and again, the punchline and the, uh, the end of the argument really is that these sorts of alternatives, treatment and a variety of social services and prevention efforts uh, are what it's going to make uh, for less recidivism, um, less harm to the community in the long run. And I'll stop there and take questions uh, later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reinemann. So uh, if you've got questions, write them out, wave, wave the card in the air, and we will have somebody come along and uh, pick those up. Our next speaker is Jane Wynn, who is our Health Services Agency Director. Ms. Wynn has experience in many aspects of health services, having worked in acute psychiatric care, children's health care, public health, mental health, and behavioral health. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Wynn. Thank you, Supervisor Perry. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Thank you. Um, thanks for being here. I wanted to um, share with you that the focus of my conversation with you this evening is about my perspective on drug abuse, drug addiction as a serious public health problem. It involves the treatment of offenders with drug and alcohol addiction problems from the public health standpoint, as well as integrating public health and public safety. So I really appreciate hearing from our sheriff, from the professor, and I look forward to hearing from one of our community members on her own experience with drug issues and incarceration. So I wanted to see a, a show of hand here. How many of you in the audience know of someone, have loved ones, friends, who actually have drug addiction problem or drug abuse issues? Almost everyone in the room, including myself. How many of you have someone that you care for, your friend, your loved one, who have addiction problems and ended up in jail, prisons? Absolutely. I have a friend, best friend of mine, died from drug addiction, drug abuse, actually committed suicide and I couldn't help the person. So it's, it's, it is a problem, it is a chronic problem, it is a public health issue, and as your public health director for this county, it is my responsibility to work with you, to collaborate with you, to support our criminal justice system to reform and to solve this problem. So um, as you have heard from our sheriff about AB 109, it is very clear to us that this AB 109 is very complex, very, very complex, and it is definitely a challenge for all local communities in California. But I am very optimistic that Santa Cruz County and the local community here can really meet this challenge and utilize it as a, an opportunity in dealing with crime issues in our community. We can really turn it around and use this as an opportunity to do the right thing. Well, I want to share with you some data. You heard about numbers and perspective earlier, but I wanted to share with you from the public health standpoint about drug addiction, drug problems. According to the National Institutes of Health, particularly the National Institute of Drug Abuse, nationwide, the number of adults involved in criminal justice system has increased from about 1.8 million in 1980 to 7.2 million in 2009. 1.8 to 7.2 million. The connection between drug abuse and crime is well known. We all know that. One half to two thirds of inmates in jail in state and federal prisons meet standard diagnostic criteria for alcohol slash drug dependence or abuse. Very high statistics, very prominent. Yet, only 7 to 17 percent of these prisoners receive treatment at jail or prisons for their substance abuse issue. So most of the 650,000 inmates receiving back into the local communities each year 
have not received needed treatment services. As a registered nurse, as a public health nurse, as a mental health nurse, it is a concern of mine big time hearing that kind of statistics. So I want to share with you why I think drug abuse, drug addiction is a serious public health problem for all of us. Number one, it is costly and it impacts our society in, on multiple levels, directly or indirectly. According to the National Institute for Mental Health, Institute for Drug Abuse, Substance abuse costs our nation more than $484 billion per year. Okay, remember this number, $484 billion per year for substance abuse issue nationwide. Now, if you compare the cost of all the chronic health problems, such as diabetes, it costs $132 billion for diabetes, $132 billion a year, remember, 484 billion for substance abuse problems, the cost. For cancer, it's $172 billion annually. As you can see, substance abuse cost, problems and the cost associated with that is tremendous for our nation, for our state, and for our local community. So the cost that I just mentioned includes the healthcare expenditures, lost earnings at work, costs associated with crime and accidents. It is a public health issue. Now, you know substance abuse individuals have a host of complicated health problems. You know hepatitis B, hepatitis C, H, HIV, TB, sexually transmitted diseases. It is a public health problem. Uh, approximately half of the pediatric AIDS patients result from injection drug use or sex with injection drug user by ch the child's mother. It is a public health problem. Driving under the influence, violence, stress, child abuse are some of the top social problems related to drug abuse. Our adolescents are very vulnerable to drug abuse and other risk-taking behaviors. Part of the adolescents growing up, they take risk. They're very vulnerable. People with mental illness are particularly at risk for problems associated related to substance abuse. Drug abuse affects us all, affects us all. Homelessness, crime, education, and the workplace. It is a public health problem. So how do we solve these public health problems at our local community level? I think that's what you hear, we all hear, we want to know, how do we do that? We all know it's a problem. We know it's a chronic problem. How do we solve it? I think we have the golden opportunity of the AB109 um, implementation to tackle these problems. I think that from reviewing the data that we got for the AB109 um, non-violent, non-sexual offenders, um, non-serious folks who are coming back from our community, we know that before the enactment of the Assembly Bill 109, we saw that 92% of the population that we sent to prison and now coming back to our community, 92% of them have had had a drug and or alcohol offense or abuse history. It's very high. So I think I have somewhat proven the case that it is a public health problem. problem. It is that among our um, individuals incarcerated in jail, coming back from prison, has a high incidence of drug abuse, drug addiction issues. So I think this is an opportunity for our community to work together and to do the right thing with AB 109. And that we know that if left untreated, we heard from the professor, drugs abusing offenders can relapse to drug use and return to criminal behavior. We know that. We've seen it. You all raise your hands. You've seen it. You have people in jail you know and you care for. And we know from looking at research, evidence-based practices, best practices, that providing treatment to the individuals with in criminal justice system will decrease future drug use and criminal behavior. So I will discuss later at the end of my presentation my perspective on approaching drug abuse and addiction problems from the public health standpoint. But next, I want to provide you with some highlights, a positive 
of the positive we have currently regarding the resources we have in our community, in our county. What we have currently to provide services for these individuals, I think you like to know that, right? So I'm gonna go over that very briefly, and I have wonderful staff in the audience. Uh, we have our behavioral health director, we have our drug and alcohol program administrator, we have our um, program manager that help us with jail medical services and the acute crisis uh, system. They will be able to really talk with us um, during break time or answer any questions relating to those uh, particular programs. But I just wanted you to know that first I want to acknowledge that Yes, we do not have enough funding. Yes, we do not have enough resources to provide services for everyone. But we will not use that as an excuse to not be innovative, to not work together, and to not be collaborative and to do the right thing. So I want to make sure I say that. And, and we're not perfect, and we have a lot of room for improvement. So we have a full range of detoxification, residential treatment. We have our outpatient, we have day treatment, we have methadone maintenance services that are available for persons involved into the criminal, in the criminal justice system. So in 2010-11 fiscal year, the county in partnership with our community-based providers and organization, we serve approximately 800 adult clients who were involved with the criminal justice system. Still, we know that we are serving only a small fraction of those who potentially need alcohol and drug treatment. We need to do more. We have a methadone clinic. We have those services um, located on 1000 Emmeline Avenue. And um, I have the phone number here if you like to talk to us about the program. We're more than happy to provide you with more information. And I can have staff talk with you about qualification or criteria to enter those programs. For perinatal substance abuse services, we work with Janice Perinatal, and it's located on 516 Chestnut Avenue. And we also have residential and outpatient treatment program for pregnant and women with children. We also operate um, by, by Santa Cruz Community Counseling Center at Phoenix Services, we have the Primeros Passos program, and we also have, this program provide alcohol and drug treatment providing individual group and family counseling for pregnant women with young children. We also have um, them provide vocational rehab, job counseling with a primary emphasis on Latino population and migrant workers. Bilingual services are available in these locations. Um, I wanted to highlight some very good innovative programs that we have in our system that I think have been very effective. The first one is the serial inebriate program, we call it SIP. This program provides treatment instead of jail for people who have frequent arrest for public drunkenness. The SIP program has achieved significant reductions in arrests, jail days, ambulance runs, and hospital costs. And we have more details if you're interested after this uh, forum. We also have uh, a drug court that provides treatment instead of jail prison for non-violent drug offenders. And we provide intensive outpatient treatment, frequent drug testing, and judicial supervision to ensure both support and accountability for clients. The drug court serve about 45 clients in fiscal year 2010-11. And with, through the drug course, we avoided about 10, 16,000 jail and prison days at a saving of $1.2 million for our taxpayers. We also have a jail um, mental, health, mental health team in the jail that provide mental health services in the jail. And this team provides screening, crisis intervention, assessment, and psychiatric services at the Water Street Jail location. And the staff in this team link the inmates under this program with a jail discharge planner to assist with recommendation to the court and assist them through the court process. So people ask, what is your relationship between mental health and substance abuse uh, services? The good news for our community here through the good leadership of our board of supervisor, our CAO, we have substance abuse services and mental health under one umbrella. In other counties, that's not really the case. So we have these two very essential components of treatment services under the health services agency, under my leadership, and we have that 
and it's very effective in order to maximize the economy of scale and able to mobilize services and to, real, to realize cost saving through best evidence-based practices. So I think that's one big plus we need to acknowledge for our community here. Um, I see the sign tell me to stop. Uh, but I will quickly say that, um, you know, for public health, from the public health response to crime and substance abuse issue, when you hear public health, you, you know it's about prevention. It's about population-based, it's about prevention, and I am all about prevention. And I think that we need to look at ways beyond just treating the symptoms and the signs. We need to look at how to prevent to look at the causes of drug addiction, drug abuse, find out what the causes are and help with those causes from the get-go instead of waiting for the problems to occur and then treat it. So we need to have um, an adequately funded continuum of substance abuse treatment services which can serve as an alternative to incarceration for alcohol and drug offenders. The probation chief, um, Mr. Scott McDonald, our sheriff and myself, we are strong collaborate, collaborators, and I am very supportive of maximizing the use of treatment and a public health response rather than an incarceration response to drug use. Um, I think incarceration, from my point of view, should only be applied in cases where there is clear public harm, including property crimes. However, we must also consider whether a drug problem is the driver a property offending, and if so, again, treatment needs to be a high priority response. So in closing, I sincerely appreciate your attention to this important matter. It is a public health problem, and your support in joining me and the rest of the team throughout the community to use the AB 109 implementation to tackle the serious public health problem. It is a multi-faceted problem, and um, with, if we only use one tool, which is incarceration, um, we are doomed to fail. Let us join hands and support the effort to be smart on crime that are associated with substance use disorders and not use jail beds and incarceration as the only way to help these individuals. From the public health standpoint, we need more prevention, treatment, and recovery programs. And it will take the entire community to, to be part of the solution. Thank you for being here tonight and help us think through the planning and solutions. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Wynn. Next speaker is Martha Rocamontes. Uh, you've heard Janice mentioned, and Janice is a local drug treatment um, program. Uh, Martha Rocamontes is a Janice alumni and employee. Martha was born and raised in Santa Cruz County. I think you'll find her story um, very insightful. Thank you. Sure. Hi, everybody. Thank you um, for being here. And please bear with me. I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, so my name is Martha, like she said. Right now, I'm a 34-year-old mother of um, five kids. and. Um, an alumni of Janice of Perinatal and um, I could say an ex-addict or still an addict. And um, I was working for Janice as a promotora, working um, with them and trying to help other women like myself um, that find themselves pregnant with a disease and not knowing where to look for um, services or where to go. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about myself. My disease started when I was 23 years old. And um, at 23, I found myself um, pretty broken up, um, you could say depressed. I had just found out I was pregnant for the second time uh, from a man, a guy that I was with in a relationship for 11 years. Um, I found out that he had been cheating on me and um, then 
just, he's, you know, not a good man. <laughs> but um, so I told him that I was pregnant, and he said, well, have an abortion. And by then, um, I was working two jobs. I was, when I was working at Emmeline Health Services Agency as a receptionist, so, um, and then I was working graveyard at Lipton T. Um, so I found myself very depressed, just found out that, and when he told me that, um, I just didn't want to wake up anymore, just go to sleep, not wake up. And that's how I started my addiction. Um, my background's really, I have a couple brothers and cousins, family members that are drug addicts, have the same disease. And I would see my brother sleeping all day. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, I want to be doing that. I just didn't know how to ask for help, how to reach out. And um, in my family background, um, my parents were there, but never there for us. They were really hard working parents. Um, so we didn't have no communication with them. And um, there's one night, um, my brother had his thing out there. He was passed out and I'm like, well, I'm gonna try it. It's been like a week that I haven't um, slept or anything. And at the time I wasn't even using, so I didn't even know what you know that was. I knew that what that was because of my family background and my family members, but never had tried it. Um, so I did try it. I got really, really sick. But after that, like two hours later, I fell asleep, and it was a really good nap. I could say a really good. Um, but when I did that, my feelings started to go away. Um, my feelings started numbing. So I'm like, oh, you know, I guess something in me is like, this is helpful. <laughs> Instead of going to ask for mental health or counselor or psychiatrist, therapist, no. Got the easiest thing that I had near. And that's what started my disease. After that, I just couldn't um, let it go. Next thing I know, three days later, I was already strung out. Um, and it was really, really hard because I couldn't tell my brother that I was strung out and I was pregnant because that would have really broken his heart because he knew that I was straight as could be, never had used or drank or anything. And so I didn't tell him, I just kept on um, trying to get it by myself out in the streets and everything. Next thing I know is like I have my daughter and I was, I got clean after I, I had my daughter, I got clean. I don't even remember how, just I guess by myself. Um, and that ended just, after I had her, it, I started using like three months after I had her because I started having those feelings that I didn't want to feel anymore. And it's like, all the time that I was using, I didn't have any feelings, I didn't even feel, I didn't even care, um, care about anything. I ended up asking my son's father to take him because to me it was too much. I was pregnant, working, and I still had my son. My son was, like, at that time he was like five years old, so he was very, active and I just needed I guess my space because I didn't want to do it in front of him. Um, after that uh, I've been using for 11 years off and on and these 11 years I've been incarcerated almost 15 times and all for the same reason. I was a nonviolent, um, never 
property damage, never stole or anything. Always using and possession. I only have one possession, thank God. And um, all the other times that I got arrested, like I said, was for warrants, failure to appear. Um, when the first time I got arrested, yes, I did get um, the first. I don't remember what they're called, but the first program they give you the first time that you get arrested, I got that. If they told me if you're good for a year, don't get in trouble or anything, we'll take it off your record. Well, it was in not even like three months when I got arrested again for under the influence. Um, and then they're like, okay, well, you know, we're not gonna give you another program. You're just gonna do time. And I'm like, okay. So I that time I only did um, 90 days. And they said, you're going to be on probation. You have to go to your probation officer, stay clean and sober. And anytime you get stopped by a cop, police officer, you're going to have to, you know, let them search you or whatever. Well, I did. Um, I was doing that, like, for two weeks. Then... I started using again, and just a repetitive cycle. I would just come out, be out, like, do good for two, three weeks, and then again, had a warrant um, from, I could say, from 2000, like, 2007 to 2010. Out of those years, I probably was out, like, six months altogether. And it really, um, it was really hard for my family, not for me because I was using and I didn't, you know, I was just numbing up my feelings and I would call them every time I'd be in jail, call them and be like, oh yeah, I'll change, I'll change. And they'd always be by my side, visiting me, putting money on my books. Like I said, be good for two, three weeks, and again, there I go. Um, and the reason that I kept using is an excuse for others, and probably an excuse for me, but not really. Like, I had, um, like I said, I have five kids. Out of those five kids, I only have my daughter with me. And the reason I have my daughter with me is because I went into Janice perinatal after, um, in 2010, after I got released from jail. But before then, two of my kids got abducted by their dad. Um, it's been six years already that I hadn't heard from them, seen them, known anything of them. And then um, my older son is already 15. He's with his grandma here in Santa Cruz. And then I got one. Um, they got adopted. And for me, that's the only thing that was helping me deal with all those feelings that I was having, was using. And I knew that, like, when I'd get, you know, be in jail, I'd do three months, four months, and I would go to the meetings they'd give us there, and I knew about the 12 steps, I knew about having a sponsor, and but I just didn't want to use them, because none of that was dealing with my feelings anyways, you know, like, my feelings were still there, and nothing other than, um, I'm a heroin and a meth addict, sorry, that's, for me, that's what was numbing my feelings. Um, until I found myself again. Um, I was four months pregnant. I got arrested. They did a pregnancy test at jail. They said, you're pregnant. And, um, and I told them I wanted to keep it. Um, even though in my, in my heart, in my, you know, like, 
I knew that there was a slim chance of me keeping her with me because I had just gotten my son adopted in 2009. And it's barely the end of 2009 when I got arrested in November 2009. So, um, so I told them I wanted to keep her, that I was going to go on with the pregnancy. And I started seeing a doctor there. The doctor even told me, you know, there's a slim chance if you've been already in the CPS system, a very slim chance you'll be able to keep her in. Um, so I was at Blaine Street. Um, I went to Blaine Street in December of 2010. When, when I went to court at that time, that last time, um, my probation officer told judge, told the judge that since I've always been getting arrested for the same, the same charges, they were all warrants, um, that they wanted to, they wanted me to do my time and finish my, my charges already that, you know, I guess I was just costing a lot of money for taxpayers, I didn't know. And he told me, you could, if you're willing to do six months in jail, um, well, you know, when you get out, that, that'll be your time and then you'll get out without probation. For me, I was, like I said, I was pregnant, I'm like six months. Um, that was kind of a lot for me because I'm like, I'm, the chance of me having my daughter with me, it would have been going out um, to a program at least, to perinatal, because I had just gone to perinatal uh, when I had my son. But that time I wasn't able to keep him in uh, foster care. He went to foster care right away. And I tried, to, I tried to work on my recovery and I was doing my program. But the only thing that my partner, I got bypassed and my partner was the one that had the services. Uh, he relapsed, and that's what ended our services. Um, by the time that I went into perinatal, I was already, I got out February 14th, and I had my daughter on March 10th. It was the hardest thing for me because... Um, I didn't think I was gonna keep her. And thanks to the judge giving me the opportunity and, and Brianna also helping me going to the program, um, I was able to keep my daughter. Um, right now she's already 15 months old and she's my pride and joy and after being clean and sober for 18 months, um, I took it a day at a time, and I always tell my, because my sister, she's my rock, she's my everything. Um, I always tell her, you know, I just take it a day at a time, and there's been times that I've been thinking about, you know, like, what if, what if, but thank God I have my daughter, and I'm here and I'm clean and sober and I'm just trying to help other women like myself. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank all the uh, speakers. Uh, we, there's a lot of experience on this stage, uh, a, a lot of research, a lot of uh, 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 real life uh, experience uh, that has helped inform this discussion. I appreciate the preparation and the hard work that everybody put in to speaking here this evening. My name is John Leopold. I'm a county supervisor uh, from the first district uh, representing Live Oak, SoCal, the summit area, and uh, one of the founding members of the Smart on Crime Santa Cruz County. Uh, in our forums, we try to g provide uh, lots of good information so people understand about some of the changes that are going on in our criminal justice system, but we also provide an opportunity for you to ask questions. 
Some of you have uh, turned in some questions, and if there are other people who want to turn in questions, we'll have uh, people go through the audience one more time uh, to pick up any uh, additional questions. Uh, but I just want to start off, and um, uh, the first question here is for uh, Professor Reinerman. Um, uh, Professor Reinerman, what will motivate addicts to finish therapy if we don't use incarceration and coerce continued participation? Uh, <clears throat> is this on? Yes. This is among the most difficult questions anybody in the drug treatment field faces, uh, as far as I can tell. Uh, there are people who will say that, uh, that being incarcerated helped them. Um, this, of course, is what they are told when they are incarcerated. Um, and it may well be true um, for some, but uh, I guess I'll just sort of reiterate what I said earlier, that the, um, unless there's something before, pr uh, preferably before incarceration, uh, and some programs during incarceration, and certainly after incarceration, that deal with the underlying sources of trouble in someone's life, uh, then incarceration alone is never going to get at it. It's going to cost a lot of money, and you're going to be right back at square one more often than not. Uh, so uh, jail may help some people. I don't want to deny that. But in, the, in most cases, I don't think that's true. It hasn't turned a lot of people around. I mean, what turns people around, uh, is the love of children, the love of family, the opportunity to have a decent job and a meaningful role in the community. I had a leader of a drug treatment program once say to me, the, the, the best cure for drug abuse I ever ran across was a good job. Right. That's most definitely. Well, thank you. Um, before the next question, I just want to remind people that uh, on your way in, you received a clipboard that had a lot of different pieces of information. There are two pieces of information that I want to I hope that you'll take uh, some time to fill out. One is a survey. Uh, this is part of the mandated. This is part of the process we're using is the mandated community correction partnership program uh, that the county is seeking input from the community uh, about how we should spend our limited. Uh, uh, correction dollars uh, that are coming to us a, as part of this prison realignment. Uh, so far we've received several hundred uh, questionnaires and we'd like your uh, participation in filling out the questionnaires so you could share your ideas with us. It's in the packet and at the end of the evening you can just give it uh, uh, to folks in, in baskets on the way out. Um, the next question I have is for our sheriff. Uh, Sheriff, what are the current plans for academic and training programs uh, for prisoners? Uh, also, what about more space for these programs, and where will we get the dollars uh, to, to do these programs? Okay, three-part question. I'll, I'll start with what are the, the programs in custody. Um, right now, in, in our custody system, we have limited uh, um, programs in comparison to what we should be able to offer to prepare people for uh, re-entry into society, but we do a very good job with the ones that we have. We have uh, a GED, um, a high school education uh, learning program. We have English as a second language program. We have overcoming uh, addiction or drug uh, abuse uh, training in custody. Uh, we have anger management uh, uh, training in custody. And uh, we have a very limited uh, regional occupation program in custody um, training uh, for outside. We've had, um, over the last three years, significant cuts in our um, uh, training program for regional occupation. But we do uh, teach limited computer skills um, and, and um, several other um, uh, occupation uh, programs through the County Office of Education. The future and what the future holds in that um, is really unlimited. Um, we have been um, engaged with, uh, in conversation with the um, County Office of Education, the Pajaro Valley School District, and the Santa Cruz School District to bring adult education into the custody system. We're trying to leverage the, uh, the Assembly Bill 109 dollars that come in uh, to the custody system and uh, partner it with uh, adult education uh, dollars that are in our uh, community education program. So uh, that, that's in, a, in its infancy right now. And in answering the first two questions, I missed the third. Where will the dollars come from, the funding? Everybody wants to know where the dollars come from or where the dollars are printed. Um, the funding for these, um, these programs in custody uh, right now come from two different uh, sources. 
inmates in custody are able to buy services and um, um, extra uh, needs in custody and the proceeds for that go to an inmate welfare fund, a fund that uh, it can, the money can only be used to the benefit uh, of inmates. But it's a, it's a very small pot of money in comparison to what's needed for future programs. The second piece of, of funding that's coming in for these type of uh, um, opportunities in the custody system uh, is the uh, Assembly Bill 109 um, allocation that each county is getting based on its population, its prison commitment rate, and, and a number of different uh, issues. Um, the Community Co Corrections Partnership divided the allocation for uh, Santa Cruz County into thirds. Uh, it was voted on unanimously that this allocation would be split with one-third to corrections, one-third to probation, and one-third to, to treatment outside of the custody system. So the treatment that's going to uh, come in the in-custody system will be born out of the uh, one-third of the Community Corrections Partnership dollars that come to my office for um, incarceration and in-custody treatment plan. Thank you very much. Uh, these are questions that, that you all handed in that, that I'm sharing uh, with the, uh, the panel here. The next one is uh, maybe for our health director, uh, Jane Nguyen. Uh, does treatment work as well if it's coerced or mand uh, mandated versus voluntary treatment? I think that's a very good question. You know, I come in from um, the mental health, um, substance abuse services background. I worked as a frontline nurse, um, working with uh, individuals who were brought in by law enforcement, by ambulance on a 5150 status um, on legal hold uh, that we could hold them against their will for um, assessment and evaluation and treatment. And um, from my personal uh, professional experience, uh, I think course treatment, uh, mandatory treatment, might serve short-term um, gratification from the provider side of it. You know, we want to see people get better quickly. But does it help people really sustain the long-term positive uh, recovery effect of it? No. I think it's better that we come from the public health standpoint, again, is prevention, is education through education to outreach to help the person with informed decision to receive treatment. I think it's better that we get voluntary treatment uh, from the public health treatment perspective. It's better that way versus mandatory. There'll be individuals who might need um, immediate um, interventions for psychosis, or for um, withdrawal syndromes uh, so that we can help them recover during that acute phase. But after the acute phase, we really need to get into the mode of helping the person understand better about the effect of getting treatment on a voluntary basis so that the person can continue on with their journey of recovery. Thank you. Uh, maybe as just a follow-up, uh, Professor Reinerman, are you aware of any studies that point to efficacy of mandated versus voluntary programs? I, d I don't know that offhand, no. Uh, but I, I would agree uh, with what Yang just said, that, um, un again, unless you're going to deal with the underlying pro the sources of pain and trauma, whatever, in, in, in the life of the person, uh, then, you know, you may uh, prevent them from using drugs while they're incarcerated. Uh, and if you force them into treatment, um, the, the downside is that they will not have made the personal commitment uh, and it's a difficult struggle, as we've heard tonight, and, and most people in the audience probably already know. It's a long, hard road, uh, and unless you are prepared to do it and committed to doing it, uh, which means voluntary, uh, then your likelihood of success goes down from there. Right. Thank you. Uh, Martha, you had a very powerful uh, story of your own personal journey, and uh, I'm wondering if you could just uh, talk about what services would have helped you that were not available when you needed them? Were there services that you wanted to get but, but that weren't there at times? I think um, counseling or therapists um, what really helped me uh, when I was at Janice Perinatal was working with my counselor, a lot of writing a lot of writing to get over, um, not to get over, but 
try to eliminate or um, lower the pain of not having my kids. Um, just coming to to an idea, I guess. Um, more than anything, I would have. I think I wouldn't have been using or been out there as much if I would have been getting help at, uh, when I really needed it by counselor or therapist, like I said, um, working with my inner feelings. Sure. And that's getting to the underlying causes that Professor Reinerman was talking about. The deal with that was, is a good way to deal with the addiction problem. Yeah. Right. Because the reason I would use was to numb all those feelings and the pain. Thank you. Uh, currently, there's a bill in the state uh, legislature, Senate Bill 1506, uh, by uh, Senator Leto, that would reduce drug possession to misdemeanor uh, offense. Um, I'm not sure uh, about what the chances are of passing, but has, uh, the, has the sheriff uh, looked at uh, what kind of cost savings that might be, uh, might be incurred if a bill like that gets passed? I'm aware of Senator Leno's bill. I, I do not know what, um, and, and we haven't examined the uh, the potential uh, savings or or even the change in our custody model if that were to go into place. Um, we're just now bringing in data uh, with regard to what Assembly Bill 109 has brought us in the last uh, um, nine months. And um, thanks to Chief Hart, I, I have some uh, a, a snapshot of today's data and. 97% of the people that Assembly Bill 109 have brought us are in custody for drug, alcohol, or a minor theft offense. Huh. And so um, that does correlate to, to Senator Leno's uh, bill, but I, I don't know how that would change. There would still be a custody um, uh, segment, whether it be felony or, or misdemeanor. I just believe the length of time would, would be reduced. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Wynn, uh, if someone goes to a county health clinic seeking drug treatment, what is available if they have no insurance and no money? Great question, too. Um, thank you for asking the question. I don't know if you're aware of the latest and greatest program that we just implemented from the county called the Low Income Health Program. Um, the Low Income Health Program was part of the health care reform movement that the state of California has implemented for counties throughout the state to opt in if we so choose to do it. And with that program, now we, if someone walked into the clinic who has no insurance, um, has no ability to pay for the services they feel they need, uh, they could be um, encouraged and staff will be there to help them fill out application for the Low Income Health Program. And that program actually has um, the benefit package of providing uh, essential mental health services and substance abuse services as the individual needs. Um, we also have, uh, we are obligated as a county to provide indigent health care uh, for those who are unable to pay. But that program is limited. We are not able to provide um, um, necessary um, substance abuse services uh, for those individuals. So I think the good news is we do have the Low Income Health Program. And also we look forward to the passage of um, health care reform by the Supreme Court in August of this year. So let's keep, keep our finger crossed okay. and let the health income, health, um, federal health reform to happen because when that happened, uh, we estimated that about 17,000 of our citizen residents here in, in Santa Cruz County will be eligible for Medi-Cal. And then we are hoping for the parity of substance abuse services, mental health services, and health services to happen as well so that people could be eligible and access mental health, substance abuse services, and primary health care as well. So that's a real benefit of, uh, of uh, the, uh, the, the Health Care Reform Act that Absolutely. was passed uh, last Absolutely. year. Absolutely. Let's keep our fingers crossed. Yeah, Thank we'll you. wait to see what happens with the Supreme Court. Um, I want to say uh, to everyone here that in the uh, packet of materials that you received, there was a list of a number of programs in Santa Cruz County in which you can get involved. It's something you're interested in. There is a volunteer uh, interest form, which if you're interested in being contacted by any of these uh, organizations, you can fill that out and hand that in at the end of the evening as well. I hope you'll take a time to be part of the solution here in Santa Cruz County. Uh, this next question is uh, for, for Professor Reinerman. Uh, it's widely understood that relapse is part of recovery, uh, but yet we send people back to jail for relapsing and treatment. 
what effect does that have and uh, does it work? Well, yeah, at the risk of repeating myself, um, if you send somebody back to jail, um, any progress they had made um, is sort of stalled. And whatever problems that they still faced and were still struggling with will remain uh, until they get out. Uh, now, there's some progress that may be made in, uh, in one of the programs that the sheriff described, uh, but, but basically relapse is a predictable part of re recovery. Uh, this is true for people who tried to quit smoking uh, or tried to quit drinking. Uh, you know you don't make it the first time or the first two or three times very often, um, but people keep trying. So um, in the alcohol field, they, they, there's a kind of shorthand where they talk about the four L's that help people get clean. One of them is law, um, but if you leave that aside, there's three more L's. Uh, liver, meaning broadly your, your health will say, you've got to cut this out now. That's partly incentive. Uh, lover. Your partner will say, I've had enough of your drinking. Uh, you've got to straighten up or I'm out of here. Uh, and livelihood. The boss will say, uh, you don't come back from these three martini lunches and take a nap on your desk for two hours. You're fired if you do that again. So all of those other incentives that the community, in one form or another, can provide, uh, it seems to me, are likely to be more effective tools uh, than yanking somebody out for, for a, a dirty urine and saying, all the things you've managed to accomplish, uh, aside from you know, caving into temptation at a certain point, uh, all that gets washed away. That doesn't help the long run for recovery. I kept on waiting for one of the L's to be Leopold, but I. Uh, uh, Martha, uh, Janice uh, that w got talked about this evening, the, the program, and has both a residential and an outpatient counseling program. Um, from your uh, point of view, how do you know when someone needs residential counseling versus outpatient or 12-step counseling? Do you have a perspective on that? Um, not really, but that's why there's um, counselors where they could make their plan treatment, um, their treatment plan together. But I would say, like, if you're been using, like me, for years and then years, I think you need residential treatment. I don't think um, day treatment's gonna help a lot. Thank you. Uh, Director uh, Wynn, uh, any sense from your perspective about when and why we, uh, people choose these different services? Yes, I think uh, it really depends on the person's signs and symptoms at the time and depends on the conditions in terms of acuity or chronic. Um, most, most of the time, the person will need a system of care approach, meaning a broad spectrum of everything that might be available to that person, including housing, um, including opportunity to, um, to gain employment, um, to seek education. Um, it's important that the person has stability in terms of housing needs um, so that that person can have a peace of mind and have access to um, necessary services. So whether it's residential treatment, whether it's therapy, counseling, most of the time it's a combination of almost everything to help the person through. Okay, thank you. I just want to remind everyone again about the questionnaire that uh, we gave you uh, and the hopes you'll fill out. We do have a Facebook page. If you look up Smart on Crime on Facebook, um, we're going to be posting information from this forum as well as uh, information we receive from the survey in the coming weeks. And we'd uh, love for you to go to that Facebook page. You can like it if, you, if that's something you want to do, but it will also pr be providing information. Um, uh, I guess this is a question for uh, the sheriff. Has the county saved any money so far by sentencing low-level offenders like drug users to electronic monitoring? And have we had any failures? Um, well, the first answer is absolutely. We've, we've saved over 6,000 bed days um, since October 1st with electronic monitoring alone. A bed day is a, is a day where one of, much like the seats in this audience, are unavailable because a person is occupying it and it can't be used for a, a high-risk offender or someone who really needs to be in custody for public safety. The electronic monitoring program um, has been offender paid, um, uh, more than 90% of it, offender paid. So um, it hasn't been a, a cost to the county to run the program 
from that perspective. The supervision behind the program is, is where the, the Assembly Bill 109 funding has come into place. And then um, lastly, have there been failures? Yes, there have been, but we've ha we have over a 94% success rate in uh, the more than 100 people that have um, participated in the electronic monitoring program to date. I appreciate that information. And maybe uh, you could just also address if uh, with these programs that we're now trying to, that we're doing, the electronic monitoring uh, program, um, trying to work with people when they're in jail, could we do that and build new jail bed uh, space uh, with, our, uh, with our funding from the state? The funding from the state barely covers our existing programs. Building uh, new jail beds in Santa Cruz County just would not be the answer. I mean, I agree with, uh, with Dr. Reinerman, with Ms. Ms. Nguyen. You can't arrest and incarcerate your way out of this problem. Um, building a new jail today in today's construction costs is over $100,000 per bed. So you do the math. If we needed to add a 100-bed facility, we would go through 20 times the annual funding uh, for the entire AB 109 program just to build the facility. Then there's the ongoing cost of staffing that facility. So uh, no, um, adding uh, uh, prison beds to Santa Cruz County isn't the answer. And, and I do believe the custody alternatives program, managing our, our inmates and, and bringing them to an incentive-based uh, uh, um, education system while in custody, and then partnering with health services other community-based organizations as they're released is, is the answer and, and probably the most cost-effective way to run this program. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers uh, on the panel tonight uh, for your work that you do day by day, for, uh, for the stories that you told and the information that you shared. It's very important uh, for our community to understand what are the drivers of incarceration in our county, uh, what are the strategies that we can use to be more successful and reducing recidivism, and ultimately all these pieces together help to promote uh, good public safety. I appreciate everyone's participation here tonight. We didn't get all the questions answered. We're going to try to share these uh, with our panelists uh, in the coming days and post them on the Facebook page. Um, if you're interested in finding out about them, I want to encourage you to, to take the opportunity to volunteer uh, and, uh, and share that interest form with us on the way out. And I want to thank uh, uh, the organizers of uh, today's uh, event, the Smart on Crime uh, Santa Cruz County. Uh, there was an organizing committee of people who uh, worked to get people to come here this evening, Community TV uh, for their work in filming tonight, and Aptos High for, for, for providing this beautiful facility. Um, We will, uh, th this is an evolving uh, part of uh, county government. Uh, we'll be working on this. I encourage you to stay informed and stay involved. Visit the Facebook page at Smart on Crime Santa Cruz County. Read the articles that are in the newspaper. And, and where you have questions, choose to get involved. We're a better community when that happens. Thank you for being here tonight.